Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Streaming, a Decoding TV podcast. I'm David Chen, and joining me today, he is the co-host of the Amazing Spider Talk podcast. You've also heard him many times here on Decoding TV. Dan Gavazdan, welcome back to the podcast. Let it rip, Dave. Let it rip. Indeed. Each week, This Week in Streaming will cover a show that's new and interesting in the world of streaming. We'll tell you if it's worth watching, and eventually we review and spoil and discuss the entire season of the show. On today's episode, we're going to be discussing The Bear Season 2. You can find more episodes of this podcast at podcast.decodingtv.com. Email us at decodingtv at gmail.com and find us on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter at decodingtv. Uh, And also, if you like this podcast and you want it to continue, we really appreciate it if you became a paid member at decodingtv.com. You can get ad-free episodes as well as early access to episodes. Now... Typically, this week in streaming, we split things up. We do, you know, the first few episodes, and then we do the final episodes, and then talk about the whole season. Obviously, we're not doing that today. Uh, we are actually going to be discussing the Barry season two in its entirety. We will start spoiler free, no spoilers, giving overall thoughts on the show, and then we're going to dive into full blown spoilers. I'll give you a recap of the whole season, uh, and we'll talk about everything that happened this season of the Bear. So, uh, why did we do it that way? Well. This one was really tough, Dan of Austin. Um, yeah. I really struggled with how to cover this show. And I, I have to start by blaming Hulu and, uh, and say that I think that it was actually legitimately a miscalculation to release all the episodes at once. Um, if they had released this week by week, we would have been... The, the, the memes, the discourse, it would have gone on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And they would have gotten so much free press out of just people talking about the show, engaging with the show over time. And the episodes are, in my opinion, substantive enough uh, that they merit a week-by-week drop. Especially Uh, this season. like The way way that it's broken up and the way that we have very character-centric episodes really leads to that kind of dialogue. Um, And especially when you have like a showpiece, and I'm sure we'll talk about episode six, like... To to relegate episode six discussion to like a blip in people's viewing schedule is a, a real mistake. You know? I agree. Uh, I, I yeah. would agree. So uh, I I'm really bummed that they decided to do it this way, and it left me in a weird spot of like, how do we cover this? Do we do like episodes one and two, and then three? You know, I, we had I originally thought, okay, let's do the first half of the season. Let's do the second, you know, and then the second half, or do we do episodes one and two, and then the whole season? And um. While the bear is fairly episodic, it is also clear to me that they're trying to tell one whole story. Like the season arc, it it feels like, okay, this is the story. It's, it's kind of how people disparagingly refer to like when TV is, it's like a novel in TV form. It's like, okay, this kind of feels like that. Uh, There are chapters, but ultimately it's like one big story. And uh, so that was part of the decision making of covering the whole season with one episode of Decoding TV. Another uh, thing that factored in is people just straight up posting spoilers left and right, like uh, on Twitter and on social media. Is like this with the weekend that the show came out. Um, so people were just charging through, watching the six hours of season two already, and just spoiling it. And so it's like, okay, like it feels weird to be talking about episodes one and two when people have already finished the show. Uh, so with all that being said, that's why we decided let's just do a full blown season two review. So again, we're going to start with overall thoughts, no spoilers, and then we'll get to full spoilery recap and, uh, and, uh, specific topics about in, season two. In the, the spirit of that approach, all or nothing, we should just cancel this conversation and wait for the show <laughs> to be canceled and then mm-hmm. talk about it. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I, which is a joke, but also like you know, there is very clearly a much bigger structure outside of the seasons that I, these showrunners clearly are, are thinking about. I, I, I think, don't I feel like season yeah. two is at all the end of, of this story, um, you know, in, in any way. Yeah. So we will give away the premise of season two, right? Season two begins shortly after the events of season one. And I'll read the plot summary from episode one of season two, which is faced with the reality of opening a new restaurant. The crew must make a plan. That's from the IMDb description of the first episode of season two. But that basically drives the entire season. That's the, the, the premise of season two of the show. Let's start with overall thoughts, Dan Austin. What did you think of season two, especially compared to season one? 
And yeah, like what were your expectations going in? Because I think we both love season one, but like, let's talk a little bit about that too. Yeah, I did love season one. Um, you know, one of the, one, my big thing with the bear is I don't think it's a perfect show. I don't think the plotting is perfect episode to episode or even season to season. You know, I don't feel like all of the characters are given the same level of depth, but it doesn't matter. I love this show. Uh, I, I think this show is really something unique. It is a show that almost feels completely counter to a lot of the other kinds of shows that we uh, get on television. It is so filmmaking oriented that like, I, I feel like every episode has a very personalized touch to it in, in the same way that like the food we're seeing being created does. And uh, it, it, there's a for, sort of like roughness and imperfection and, and, reality to the show that it captures this very unique Chicago uh, environment that I don't think has ever really been put to TV in quite this way. Uh, the the way that it showcases like American uh, entrepreneurial spirit and the struggles of that I think is unique to this show and it's pacing. I mean, there's just so much to recommend and I think season two uh, takes what season one did and complicates it uh, endlessly in, in ways that are often wonderful. I, I will say my trepidation going into the show and watching it epi episode to episode is I think a lot of, sh of shows that have ensemble casts, uh, I'm thinking about like something like Orange is the New Black, will have a very um, structured first season that tells it from a very the, the, the show from a very specific point of view uh, and uses that to explore a cast and then in subsequent seasons loses that perspective mm -hmm. um, for good or for ill um, but in, in essence kind of loses a lot of the show's thrust even if it might supplant it with beautiful portraits of all these different people and this is to me is the rare show where I felt like yes it did move away from focusing on Carmi, the, you know, the ostensible protagonist um, to the same degree it did in the first season, but I don't think it loses any of that momentum uh, for it. And it, so it uh, also enriches the supporting cast. And I think that's a really hard thing to do and made me love season two, even more than season one. Mm. I am really impressed with the bear season two. Uh, also love season one, um, and you you put well what the show gets right. I do have a lot of issues with the bear season two. You know, we'll we'll talk about those issues. I want to like I do too. I, yeah, I want to try to start with like the positive because I think overwhelmingly this is a great piece of art, and yeah. uh, people should watch it and uh, it should be appreciated, and we will try to do that. Uh, but also, I have some issues that I don't hear people really talking about, and so I want to talk about that as well. Um, but the bear season two is great, I think, because it's so hard to do a second season of a show. Well, uh, like a, especially a, a season one that was almost universally beloved, right? How do you, how do you follow that up? And what they did in this season is they completely transformed the dynamic between the characters. Um, season one is basically everyone hates each other. Like there's so <laughs> much friction going on between all the different characters, no one likes each other. Everyone resents each other. And they kind of like over the, uh, the course of the season come to appreciate each other. Season two asks, okay, what if uh, they don't hate each other anymore? Like what if people were actually unified in the, in the service of a common goal? What dramatic tension can you wring out of that? And I think it does such a good job of, hey, just because everyone likes each other or is getting along doesn't mean, A, there's not still like simmering resentments or feelings that are unaddressed. B, that you're all going to work together well. Like that doesn't necessarily mean that, that. And so it's like there's dramatic tension in those things that I think the bear season two does a great job of bringing to life. So overall, I am a huge fan of season two and uh, we have a lot more to discuss about it. So anything else we should bring up in terms of overall thoughts, Dan Gavostin? Um, I do think that season two was significantly more ambitious than season one in many ways. Uh, I, think, you, I think the budget reflects that. Like, yeah. like they, they clearly must have received a much bigger budget this season based on, and we'll talk about this, who is appearing in it, yeah. the soundtracks, 
Yeah, the, you, the you needle, know, I mean, the needle like, drops are incredible. Uh, incredible, episode. incredible. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, it um, it definitely flexes the like itself as this sort of like darling of you know modern television. Um, yeah, and. But but it, for, it spends a lot of Ill. time, as you as you said, it spends a lot of time exploring the lives of the side characters, characters yeah. who you barely know in season one. You get to know a lot better in season two. Um, obviously, the scale of what they're attempting in season two, like the characters are actually trying to accomplish in season two, is much. Uh, I'll just say more expensive. You know, like yeah. what they're trying to achieve in season two. Um, but uh, and episode lengths are also some of them are significantly longer in season two. So uh, they, they just feel like they have like a bigger canvas on which to paint in season two. And I think they really make a uh, great use of it. So I did, I did. I'm glad you mentioned the episode lengths because I think the show still knows what it is, you know, like it's a mostly a 30 minute drama mm-hmm. and I really appreciate that. You know, um, yeah. there are some episodes, like you said, that are longer, but I don't think they're longer. Um, without a real justification for doing so, you know, Absolutely. Uh, even though we're expanding the cast here, they still keep these plots very simple. Like someone's fixing something and someone else is cooking <laughs> something. And right. like, uh, I could knock it for, you know, reducing it in that way. And, and sometimes the plots are a little too simple, um, to sustain, yeah. but it's like, I appreciate that the show is not trying to get ahead of its skis in, in that regard. Totally. Totally. Well, those are some of our thoughts on the bear season two overall. Let's get to the actual plot of what goes on in the bear season two. So from this point forward, you should assume there's going to be full blown spoilers for the bear season two. Okay. So here we go. Um, Season one of the bear ended with all of our characters discovering that Mikey Brazado had hidden hundreds of thousands of dollars in tomato cans inside the restaurant. While this saved his brother Carm from immediate financial ruination, the 300000 is only a fraction of what Carm needs to manifest what he thinks is his destiny, opening a high-end restaurant in the space where the original beef of Chicagoland used to be. In order to do this, Carm needs to borrow an additional $500,000 from his Uncle Jimmy. Uncle Jimmy agrees with the high-stakes stipulation that if the restaurant fails, Jimmy gets to sell the building and the land it's on. Carm's sister Natalie signs on to be the project manager, kind of. And Carm works with Sydney to build out the menu for the restaurants, uh, for the new restaurant, whose name will be The Bear. Throughout the season, we learn more about our beloved side characters. Marcus has a sick mother but needs to leave to go learn how to be a pastry chef in Denmark. Tina and Ibrahim are sent to a culinary school class, but Ibrahim finds it difficult to manage all the change. Richie becomes a stage at one of the best restaurants in the world and finally seems to grasp the value of great discipline and service. And Carm meets a girl named Claire from his childhood. The two enjoy a romance, which makes Carm feel torn between his career and his personal life. As the season winds to a close, the restaurant does a soft opening for friends and family, seemingly successfully. Carm accidentally locks himself into the walk-in freezer, requiring Richie to take on an impromptu role, uh, leadership role and save the day. Carm and Natalie's mother, played by Jamie Lee Curtis, shows up, but leaves because of deep-seated personal issues that she has relating to her family. Carm confesses to Tina that he never should have let his affection for Claire get in the way of his work, only to find out that, whoa, twist! Claire was actually the one listening to him outside the fridge, and their relationship is probably over now. Sydney and her father have a lovely moment of bonding, as Sydney is vomiting in the space behind the restaurant due to the anxiety and stress from the opening. And that's basically where we leave season two. I think, I think, oh, I, I don't know if I mentioned um, Mark, I think we find out Marcus's mom is probably her situation has escalated. I don't know if I mentioned that. I don't think I did. Um, but yeah, that's another kind of cliffhanger from season two. Um, so that's most of what happened, the big developments, obviously a lot of nuance there that I didn't cover. Yeah. But those are the main events uh, of what goes on. So let's talk about uh, what we thought about some of these big developments, right? Like, uh, as I mentioned, the bear season two takes some big swings. Specifically, it completely jettisons the, the interpersonal friction from the first season. People still have personal issues, but they're working towards the same goal. Uh, I think... It's a great decision. They already mined a lot of the territory from the first season. The tone of the second season is a lot more chill. It's less people screaming at each other all the time and more. Like, there's a lot of that. There's still a lot of that. Yeah. But it's a lot more like, hey, let's try to work out these issues like adults. Um, how did you feel about the dynamic and how it was switched up in season two, Dan Kvostin? 
Well, I think if there's one thing that people took away from the bear season one, or if, like if you wanted to meme that season, it was like, this is what it feels like to have anxiety put on screen. Right. And that <laughs> mm-hmm. became like a real kind of characteristic of mm-hmm. the bear, you know? Uh, and so like, yeah, when, when, if you're going to kind of not whole out, you know, wholesale abandon that feeling, you know, that is a swing, like you said. Um, and I think it, it ebbs and flows throughout the season. You know, you get like an, uh, an episode, like episode six, which is basically like pouring hot coffee down your pants. Um, you know, it's just so shocking and, and, and alarming throughout. But, um, yeah, I, I actually really like this and I'm very curious to see how it will continue to evolve in future seasons. Um, you've got, it's, it's almost reflective of the type of restaurant that is being operated on, you know, as the, as they move from this kind of, you know, uh, beef sandwich restaurant into this, like, you know, uh, upper level cuisine, you see the kind of infrastructure slowly taking place and reinforcing these relationships. And I think it's interesting for me, this season is really defined by like the ideas of like family versus found family and Mm -hmm. how those things can ebb and flow, you know, between each other. And you've got different characters that have different relationships with their family members from, you know, the pastry chef that is, um, you know, clinging to his relationship with his mother as she's on death's door to like, uh, Carmi who wants nothing to do with his mother and kind of everywhere stage in between. Um, and I don't know if I would describe it that way, his relationship with his mother that way, but well, I, I, I mean, would say, he, say that, he that, does that, not want her coming to the opening. Let's say, let's say that like, mm, I, you know, yeah, I, it's, they, they have it's, a very it's challenging a, relationship. Yeah. I, I can, yeah. I can agree with you there. Um, so yeah, you know, and, and, and there is this idea that like how supportive people are within the food industry and, and things like that. I mean, I don't know how reflective on reality it is, you know, but like within the reality of this show, like I like that that seems to be sort of the pivot in terms of like, they're exploring all of these different relationships in the different States that they're all in. And it doesn't have to just be ones defined by anger. Like there are some beautiful relationships, you know, I, I think like we've got, um, uh, uh, what, uh, what's her face? Sydney and her father, you know, mm-hmm. have this really great relationship, even if he's not, you know, re- respectful initially of the work that she's doing and is kind of dismissive of the amount of passion she puts into it. But you can still Play, see played, like, played by Robert Townsend, yeah, by the way, the, yeah. the, the meteor man himself plays Sydney's father. So yeah, well, uh, I mean, that's a whole other discussion of like, he looks, he looks amazing by the way. He dude yeah. is 66. Uh, he looks, you know, like he's aged very, very well. I have to say. So yeah, every new character in this is a who's who of, of character actors and uh, things like that. So it's, it's pretty and, wonderful. And non-character yeah. actors. And non-character just actors. Act- yeah, just plain yeah, actors. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Anyway, what do you think of this kind of dynamic change? Yeah, I thought it was, uh, it, it worked really well. And as I mentioned in the opening, I think that like there's still territory to mine. You know, that that it's bold. It's bold of a of a show to to make a season. Everyone says, "Wow, that was great. Love that." And then you're like, okay, I'm going to do something very different this time. Like the, the dynamic is going to be noticeably different this time. People are going to transform in sometimes dramatic ways. Uh, it's risky. It's risky. And yeah. they're walking a tightrope. And I think they did a great job kind of transitioning it to this new dynamic um, where there's somewhat less screaming, although it does still <laughs> bubble to the surface, um, including at the very at the very end of the show. Um you know, you mentioned the structure of the show, Dank Boston, and I do think that one place where the risk has not necessarily paid off or might not, not, not necessarily paid off, but like, let me put it this way. Season one of The Bear came out of nowhere. Everyone loved it. It was amazing. And if the show had never received a second season, it would have been like, wow, what a blessing that was to, to have in our lives. Like um, a full blown arc of a show you know, decent ending that feels somewhat satisfying, but also is open-ended. 
I would have been completely fine if it end, end, ended in season one. I would have, you know, loved to see season. I'm glad season two exists, and I think it is amazing. Uh, but I'm just going to put this out there. I don't think I would be happy if this was the ending of the show. Like, it, it really yeah. feels like uh, there are some things in the season two finale that are so open ended. Um, my, my one of my colleagues who is a director once told me uh, once shared feedback with some of my work in this way it, season two takes a complete thought and makes it incomplete right in my opinion i'm not saying that's a bad thing because if there's a season three or four or five and it completes the thought then it's like oh wow we can see the vision and it was a masterpiece all along but it does give me a little bit of trepidation because it's like oh wow they, there's clearly a broader vision for this as you said beyond what is in season two right like uh, the way it ends so abruptly, especially with Marcus's character, especially with like Carmen Richie's blow up and Claire's blow up, um, it really feels like there's more left to this story. Um, so yeah, uh, that's I, the, I don't yeah. think it's quite on the level of like say like across the Spider Verse kind of ending. You know, <laughs> like I do think yeah. there are thematic uh, like closings to this chapter. You're right; it, it would not feel like an you know an end of right. a thing, um, yeah. but. I, I felt pretty. It, it doesn't feel like it's intended. It doesn't feel like it's intended to be an ending. No, show, right? but you know, at least they got to the point of like that. Next season is going to be the opening of the restaurant. Like mm -hmm. we we got yeah. through all of that. Presumably, like, yeah. and a lot of the characters by the end of the season have landed somewhere on how they how they balance work and life and what kind of value that takes in their lives, you know, like whether they're at the end of that journey, I don't think so, but like they seem to have kind of all landed at least somewhere on w that spectrum, of, you know, in a place where they're seem to be moving forward in, uh, uh, with that, you know, uh, yeah. Carm so I, I, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, Dan, you had some thoughts on the filmmaking of this season, right? Like, sure, yeah. Yeah, why don't, why don't you, yeah. I mean, that's what I love so much about this show. I tend to think that television is a very, like, writers and actors medium, you know? Like, oftentimes with production being as quick as it is and relatively low budget compared to the amount of you could spend on a shot in, like, a feature film, uh, you don't often get, like, directors or, you know, filmmakers putting really definitive stamps visually on a project, you know, in the form of like montage or, um, you know, uh, creative ways to cover a scene. It's oftentimes like just back and forth and we got to get it. We got to get the scene. And I don't think there's a moment in the show that isn't like considered with all of the elements of filmmaking at play. You know, uh, you've got a brilliant like one -er shot in the final episode of the show that weaves in and out of the kitchen and is relatively invisible at doing that. You know, you've got all of episode six, which feels like, um, it looks like it was shot on like 16 millimeter. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. You know, it, it looks it like reminded it was, yeah. me of the film Krisha. I don't know if you, or mm. Krisha. I don't know if you've seen that film. Um, I haven't seen it, but I'm familiar. I'm very familiar with that director's work. So I've seen, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Um, like that film is just like an anxiety attack, uh, for, but like around a family gathering, it felt very similar to that. You know, the music choice is really specific and it, you know, elevates every bit of dialogue as it lays underneath these things. I thought there were so many moments of editing that were like funny, exciting, like Sam Raimi esque, like push zooms and, and, and dollies. It, like I think about episode six where it's pushing in on the timer, you know, there's just so many things that I thought were like really engaging with the filmmaking um, that really elevated this to me. Like, even if I felt like some of the plots weren't entirely there, I was all never knew what to expect. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I would put some of the montages in this up there with the like, cooking montages in breaking bad you know like yeah. there's just some really incredible stuff yeah um uh, uh, like uh there is a moment i think in in the penultimate episode or the uh, the last episode where sydney makes natalie an omelet yes uh, uh the episode, it, final episode yeah it's just so it's beautifully done i don't think it's the final episode cause oh, okay because the the final episode begins when she's already like screaming out orders if i recall correctly this is so, what happens when you binge yeah. something <laughs> yeah, yeah um 
But yeah, there's a scene where Sydney is putting together an omelet for Natalie, and it's just so beautiful. Like it, it makes the art of cooking into something that feels so um, loving, but also intricate and thoughtful. Mm-hmm. But I gotta say, Dang Vazen, I actually think the filmmaking choices this season, while still like every, there are montages, there's tons of close ups. Um, there's flourishes like with episode six when it feels like they shot on film, old old school film. Um, despite all that, I felt like season two was less flashy than season one in, oh. in some ways. Um, and I think that a lot of the season, if you go back, you look at all the shots from season two, a lot of the shots are just close up on face. Like, yeah, it's true. That is a ton. Of, it's like. I would almost argue, you know, a case could be made like majority of shots or like, you know, c- certainly a significant percentage, like a quarter of the shot, 10 to 25 percent of the shots are like just close up of a person's face. And uh, you get to really study these faces, but it really relies heavily on the performances in my opinion. Like these performances need to be pitch perfect. They need to be nuanced. And in general, I think they are. Um. I do think the filmmaking does like there, there are, you know, big moments, the finale, the episode six, you know, like the montages, close-ups, rapid cuts, that kind of stuff. Uh, but to me, it felt like much, you know, maybe I, I, I got to go back and rewatch the bear season one again, but it did, it did feel more chill to me in a way that reflected the tone of the overall season and kind of what the themes of the overall season are. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I, I point out the most showy, ones you know but like there is there is artistry and restraint too yeah 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 absolutely i mean like um the show can also slow down dramatically like think of the end of episode seven when academy award winner olivia coleman shows up uh (laughs) and has a conversation with richie and that is just a pretty much a shot reverse shot conversation for like what seems like many many minutes you know and it's just like the show does know when to pull back and it feels like it did that a lot more this season because they're focusing on all these quiet moments between the characters i thought so yeah well i mean i think that helps to highlight when they're not doing that you know like in interesting ways i mean like uh, it has to be talked about the that shot in the final episode of where it circles from the kitchen out through the dining room and the sound design changes based on the location i mean yeah what a wonderful idea i mean it 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 brings to mind like uh, uh, Michael Bay's Pain and Gain, but like in a really, you know, uh, wow. I mean, th- that's a deep, deep cut, deep but, cut. but deep people cut. who've seen that movie know the shot I'm talking about. Um, but uh, well, Michael Bay does like this circular, this circular thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like you also, he also did a similar shot in Bad Boys 2. And I think one of the Transformers movies, this was not circular because there was only one door. Right. Yeah, but yeah, the, the the camera basically in the finale of season two, it goes into the kitchen and then it comes, it's, you know, soups around, comes back out, and I think there's like ten twenty minutes where it's one long continuous shot, um, where you're seeing the calmness of the actual restaurant itself juxtaposed with the uh, madness inside the kitchen and trying to fill all the orders, um, and yeah, it's it's exceptionally done. It's it's kind of an analog. This season's analog to the season one episode that was one long continuous shot. Right. Yeah. And um, I, I, I was, you know, watching the show looking for this. Cause like when something becomes a signature of your show, you're probably want to try to repeat it in some way. And my hesitation is always like, no, let stuff stand on their own. Like do it only if the story requires it or if it elevates what you're doing. And I thought in this case, they had every justification to do it. And I found myself, I didn't even notice it was happening until like halfway through it because I found, thought it was so engaging from a second to second movement through that camera that I was mm-hmm. not even, I was so wrapped up in it. I wasn't even like, you know, checking, like, was it cutting or not? You know, I think it's like something like 1917 where it's very showy in that aspect, but I don't feel like it's really like, uh, lifted up by doing something like that because you're just, you're, you're tracking it the whole time. Yeah. And here I was, you know, it's seamless, but once you start noticing it, 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 then the brilliance gets like kind of layered on. And, um, I don't know. I, I think that's like a, like an even higher level of artistry is like do this kind of stuff, but make it invisible. Indeed. 
Well, you know, I think there are two episodes that really define for me what the show is trying to do in season two, right? That's episode six, which shows a nightmarish family dinner with tons of guest stars, and episode seven, in which Richie interns at a restaurant and then gets a personality transplant. Let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about these two episodes because, I, like, for me, when I think back on the season, it's basically going to be episode six, episode seven, and then to a lesser degree, episode ten, which is also like a big one. Yeah. Um, those are kind of the big standouts for me. It is a bold decision for the bear to start with five relatively chill episodes <laughs> and then all of a sudden hit you with this wild episode, like completely out of nowhere. You don't expect it. Like, it's I mean, not like they, they... they telegraph it the minute it starts. They're like, hold on to your seat. Like it starts with its own credits and <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, 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 you yeah. know, it's like, here's you, you, a you, movie prepare. You yourself. know, you know, yeah. when the bear puts like the full credits, like opening credits, before the, yeah. the episode begins, that there's going to be something different about that episode. And then there's like a bunch of new names and you're just like, oh, what am I about to get into here? Yeah. 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 So th there is the uh, Feast of the Seven Fishes uh, going on, which is uh, a tradition. I think it takes place on December 24th. I've never had this myself. I don't know if you have I participated have heard of it. this, but yeah. never done it myself. Yeah. No. Um, so uh, it's I think it's roughly five years prior to the events of this season. Right? Correct. And uh, Mike is still alive. Mike is still alive. Carm is uh, visiting home and there's a bunch of friends and family over for this big feast. Um, and the minute Bob Odenkirk showed up, I was like, oh boy, here we go. Yeah. And the, the show really just airdrops you in there. It doesn't explain like who these people are, what their relationships are or anything like that. You just kind of got to get it. Um, but I think you and I both had a really strong reaction to this episode, which is, wow, that was an incredible piece of work, right? Like, that's just, um, there's so many amazing things about this episode, but probably my biggest takeaway is that Academy Award winner Jamie Lee Curtis gave, in my opinion, a better performance in this episode yes. than the movie for which she won an Academy Award. Yes. And let me just say, Everything Everywhere All at Once was my number one film of that year. So no yes. no no shade against Everything Everywhere All at Once, but she is incredible this season. Of and the show. unrecognizable. Like, mm -hmm. you know, of course it's Jamie Lee Curtis, but you know, if I didn't know she was showing up in this episode, it would have definitely taken me a beat to to pick her out. I mean, I I I think she really transforms herself. Um and I don't I don't just mean like physically. I I mean like all the things you recognize about Jamie Lee Curtis or sort of charm, I think are really stripped away and you're given this whole new person. Yeah, I agree. And, um, she clearly has some psychological challenges. I'll say like emotional challenges. This character does. And it's really subtle the way it's portrayed. Um, there's, there's a lot of like, lovely things about this portrayal first of all it kind of you see it kind of ebbs and flows like sometimes she's uh behaving in a very highly functional way that's like comes off very uh, uh unconcerning to people and then sometimes you can feel it really escalate from nowhere uh and then she kind of like is talking in these loops and like talking herself into these terrible stories yeah these terrible versions of herself and the people around her it's really heartbreaking to watch and uh, it's definitely, you know, elements of this behavior I've recognized in certain family members of mine. Um, and it's just kind of, uh, it's just an amazing showpiece performance. Um, the episode's also very, like, <laughs> uh, it's so differently paced than all the other episodes. Like, they're just like, hey, we're going to have a scene of Richie and his wife just kind of hanging for, like, 10 minutes, you know, and just like having conversation and there's no, there's no, uh, big plot takeaway from this. There's, you know, it's just kind of like, it's a lot of character building is what this episode is. Oh yeah. Learning I mean, about how these people came to be the way they are in the show. Right. And their histories and the specific things that have informed their histories and what they carry with them into the future. Um, well, yeah. speaking of episode, you know, six and seven, like these two episodes together were really like, I thought transformational in regards to the Richie character, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, like in me, episode six, that, yeah. yeah, I felt like it was the first time I ever saw him 
be uh, like unguarded, you know, with in, his... in episode six, right? When yeah, he's, when yeah. he's with his wife, or even when he's with like Uncle Jimmy to some degree, right? right. Yeah. There is a sensitivity to that guy that uh, I don't think we really saw in season one of The Bear, and you know, I think the first half of the season, he really, you know, puts his guard up even stronger, you know, and gets into fights with people in in the restaurant and so to suddenly zip back here right before we get this episode you know the seventh episode which is the transformational episode for him it shows you like what he is capable of as a character like there is potential there like there is a soft caring guy there um you know flaw still flawed but um you saw like what someone might see in him, you know, like, like how he came to have a family, uh, because it's kind of hard to perceive, you know, looking from the future backwards, um, that anyone could tolerate the level of, uh, insecurity that he kind of projects outward, uh, at all times. Um, so yeah, I thought this episode was really interesting for him, uh, and and to have like a one, two punch, of that I, I thought really punctuated, you know, like you said earlier this season. Uh, any other MVPs? I mean, you know, John Mulaney was in the episode. Yeah. Sarah Paulson was in the episode, but like, I, I thought those were pretty uh, understated performances. Like I didn't like J- Jamie Lee Curtis that you put that on an Emmy reel. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like uh, the other guests showing up, it was nice to see these, these actors. I mean, I'm curious, like, uh, if it was distracting for you, you know, I think you wanted to talk about this a little bit. Like, yeah, how, how did you feel about like literally everyone at the dinner being famous? Right. I mean, it it is it is shocking, you know, like <laughs> like you know, th- there are people that just like wander on screen. And I'm like, what? Uh, you know, like I think my wife and I who watched this together, we're just like constantly like uh like dumbstruck by who like who additionally like walked onto the screen um you know i think for the most part it works you know like the the joy i think of bear season one is is that like these are all mostly relative unknowns i mean yeah you have like oliver platt and you have like maddie matheson if you're like into food media you know he's a pretty you know fixed staple there and you know, uh, you know, you've you've got Abby Elliott, but like no nobody on the level of like Jamie Lee Curtis just kind of wa- uh, wandered on screen. Um, and here it's like you just listed a bunch of them. It is, it is it's well used in this sort of flashback episode, and most of these characters we don't see again. Um, for me, John Mulaney was the one that stood out the most, just because he is so John Mulaney mm-hmm. and. John Mulaney he, is a yeah. wonderful, like persona, Comed- yeah, but yeah. he's not the average persona you bump into at one of these things, you know, like he is a, an odd guy and he's kind of just doing John Mulaney. And as much as I appreciate that, it did stand out to me. Uh, that being said, he does deliver one of the most emotionally powerful moments in the episode, yeah. right? Which is yeah, when he yeah. So like, I'm not really complaining, right? But it right. Is, it does stand out from the kind of like casting approach of season right. one. I would which say. is in season one, you're like you barely recognize any of these people, basically, right? And because uh, uh, most of them are not household names, they will be soon, I think. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a big difference. Um, Can we talk about like the feeling of like and your reaction to episode six? Because I know we talked about it briefly, but like like in the performances, but there is an overall like kind of spell uh, of that episode that I think deserves like a word or two. You know, I mean, I think that I've had a couple people reach out to me uh, and say, wow, episode six really nailed what it's being like at one of these dinners. Yeah. Right. Like that, that they, they felt the verisimilitude is very true. And though the events depicted in episode six, like, I like that it, um, there's many things I like about the feel and the atmosphere, right? First of all, uh, you kind of get how like aimless some of these dinners, like some of these long parties can be where it's like, all these side conversations, you get snapshots of people's lives and maybe some big things are in the works and you're cooking up some deals and maybe you're going to try to borrow some money, but whatever. But like, it, it's kind of like, Oh, there's kind of this ebb and flow of, Hey, we're doing this. We're doing that. You know, people intersecting with each other in unpredictable ways, but really the ending of the episode with the wild swings 
in tone, uh, I felt, again, not only felt true to life, but felt very dangerous to me in a, in a, the in fork exciting, sequences. Yeah. The fork sequences in it, like tough, in, dangerous in a, in a way that I thought was like exciting and good as a viewer dangerous. If you're in the situation where, yeah, uh, there's a big confrontation between Mikey played by John Barenthal and Bob Odenkirk and about whether they're going to throw a fork and you, you just feel everyone in at the table being like, please don't do it. Like, <laughs> Please I don't, felt, don't throw the fork. Yeah, don't ruin this meal. Like, don't do like so, you know. Um, and you just feel like the the toxicity of these men bubbling towards the surface in a way that feels like it's almost uncontrollable. And then John Mullaney comes in and says, Grace, and it's like, oh, like tension's gone, everything's good again. And then it like reescalates again, you know, like it co- <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, that's going to be the end of the episode. But no, like, why should I have thought that the bear is going to give us a clean, happy ending? That makes no sense. Um, I was not expecting her to drive through the wall of the house. Right. Natalie obviously s- says a thing that triggers uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's character. And uh, and then, yeah, she leaves a fight, breaks out, and then she drives through the wall of the house. And uh, and then there's a close up of, uh, uh, I think, uh, what, cannolis, right? Are they? Yeah, on, on the table, and and you see like Carm focusing on them, and like it's it's forever associated cannolis with this event in his life, um, and it's very traumatic. It's a traumatic experience. Like I I I felt so sorry that these people had to go through this. You know these these characters, but but then you kind of understand how they sublimate this trauma through the work that they do, right? Like the, you, you get a sense, in my opinion. That these characters, specifically uh, Carm and Natalie, his sister, feel like they need to work hard. They need to like keep working. They need to stay in motion uh, because, like, if they stay in motion, then they don't need to think about these things that have happened, right? Like, they don't need to like process these things. That's my interpretation, anyway. Yeah, of, absolutely. Of why, why those characters? Yeah. So, anyway, I, I've gone on for a while about the feel of the episode. Dank Vosden, any thoughts on? I mean, I just want to like t- like talk about the construction of like the sound design and the production design. Like the house itself is so cluttered. Mm-hmm. It, 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 there's so many textures going on. At, oh, I love at, at I love once. that the uh, furniture was uh, shrink wrapped. Yes, I think I saw. yeah, a very nice touch. Very nice, like middle <laughs> middle class you know, home touch, I thought. It's exactly right. But I mean, like there's that, but then like even the kitchen where things are just like, like you've got the pristine couches, but the kitchen that is piled up with things. And like Jamie Lee Curtis has like food on her hands for like whole conversation. And it just, I mean, my, my like ADD and ASD diagnoses, like we're going off like overdrive. Like I, I don't like going home for the holidays Um, And I've learned, you know, how I react to that because my family is quite large and it gets exactly like the feeling of this episode, which is the people constantly talking and movement and all this stuff. And this was like, I I wouldn't say it was triggering for me, but like it brought me back to that deep uncomfortability where I used to go and hide away in my own house to get away from, uh, Hmm from this feeling of like lack of control. And I really much like related to the Carmi character who seems to be kind of doing a similar thing, which is kind of, you know, sitting back a little bit and, uh, and he's maybe chosen to not engage fully um, in, in this uh, thing. And uh, it just, I've never seen a piece of media, maybe other than like Cresha, like capture the feeling of the chaos of, family gatherings like remove all the toxicity of it like the layered audio mm-hmm. is really how people talk in environments like this and normally that's like celebrated on film like this party's fun look at all these things going on and i've never related to that because i just can't stand large format parties and so it just my brain can't handle it and so seeing this depiction i was like boy someone really like pulled that right out of how it uh, hits in my brain and so I, I wanted to highlight that because i i so related to uh the feeling of this episode yeah. um yeah and and perhaps all the things i brought with my uh interpreting it but uh, uh it is a unique depiction and uh and, and worth i think uh pointing out anyway 
Anything else about episode six we want to mention? You know, we do get a little bit of a uh, of Claire uh, backstory there, so you know, kind of neat, kind of needed that. I mean, a that's little about bit. all we're ever going to get about Claire, you know, and and it is it is kind of just as shallow as uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Claire. Anything we'll talk else about Claire? About in a little Claire. Bit. Yeah, um, I did think it was a really nice moment when uh, Richie's wife accidentally says to. Uncle Jimmy, oh, thanks for giving Richie a job. And there's this really tense <laughs> moment. And Uncle Jimmy kind of has mercy on Richie yeah. and, and bails him out of that moment. I don't think he ended up giving Richie a job, as far as I can tell. Um, no, I don't think so. But, but it was just to get him out of that moment. And that was, that's nice. You know, like it's, it's rare where you have that much power over someone's life. And Uncle Jimmy decided to take the path of mercy. And that was, uh, that was a nice moment. So. Yeah, uh, Uncle Richie is kind of an MVP. Uh, Uncle in my Jimmy. Book. Sorry, Jimmy. Yeah, Uncle Jimmy. But yeah, episode six, huge showpiece, extremely stressful to watch. Uh, just tension everywhere. Really well executed episode. Different from all the other episodes in length, in tone, in style. Uh, and just like, hey, here's, here's filling in a little backstory that's going to be important to understanding our characters for the rest of the season. I mean, again, as you mentioned in the preamble, Dan Gavazin, I just imagine people would have been talking about this for weeks. If you, yeah. if you had dropped this, if you had dropped this week, week by week and you had dropped this you know, episode, people would have been so blown away. They would have been so on it. Like at that point, we would have been watching one show for five weeks and then another one comes in episode six and it's like, uh, that's amazing, right? Hey, expand it by half an hour. You've got a best picture nominee. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. All right. Uh, let's talk about episode seven forks. Uh, so in this episode, Carmi talk has about a contrast, by the way, right? Car- Carmi has figured out a way to get Richie an internship or, or a, a stage, a be- ha- have him become a stage at one of the best restaurants of the world, which is also in Chicago. You know, because Carmi is friends uh, with the sh- chef and owner of that restaurant. Um, so during the course of this episode. Uh, Richie starts by drying forks, but then he starts observing all the things that are necessary to run a restaurant this nice and all the the high levels of service that are necessary to, to run the restaurant. Uh, and he starts like getting to learn all the friend the the other coworkers. He like learns uh, I don't even know what I apologize. I don't know what that woman's role is called where she's kind of in the kitchen and kind of calling out everything that's going on. Um, kind of the air traffic controller of the kitchen, you know what I'm talking about? Like all mm-hmm. that stuff. And uh, and it basically develops an appreciation for discipline and service. And uh, I thought this was an amazing episode, but also I almost laugh, like I almost thought it was kind of ridiculous how little amount of time this episode covers because uh, when we're watching the episode, there's like a montage of Richie, like learning all the dishes and dressing in suits. And, the, yeah. and I'm thinking, oh, weeks are going, this is like a month <laughs> of time, you know, weeks are going by. And then at the end of the episode, he's like, well, it sure has been an eventful week. <laughs> it felt like, yeah. It felt like a Simpsons episode of like, well, that was a really exciting 24 hours we've had, you know, and it's, it's like, whoa, like that was the only part that I didn't believe is that this transformation full-blown transformation of richie could happen in one week and Um, the amount of time that everybody working there has to dedicate to him you know like (laughs) like they they were told this is the like best restaurant on planet earth and everybody is just like we got time to take in this pet project you know like and and argue with this guy about cleaning forks like uh, if he didn't want to clean forks like i I, like i'm sorry like I, i i i would think that he would be booted Almost immediately for giving that kind of attitude, right? I, um, I, I love I love the arc for the character. Like, yeah, I, I love I, I love that it's like he's kind of a screw up, and he kind of learns everything and because and, and but he's still what I enjoy about it is he still kind of has Richie flavor. He's still swearing at the end. He's still prone to bouts of anger at the end. You oh, know, totally. I, and when he goes out to take the food out to the people, it's like in his own style. It's in his own style, right? He's yeah, not just yeah. being a complete different person. So yeah. I like all that stuff. It's just like, ooh, like some of the plausibility of that happening in one week <laughs> uh, feels a little stretched. That said, in terms of that genre of episode where it's like someone, you take a person who's one thing and then he becomes another at the end, it's a great episode of television, right? It's like, wow. Um, but it, 
part of me at the back of my head is like, is this the same guy that from season one who's like screaming at everyone all the time? And, you know, I like that in season two, he has already started to address his anger issues. Yeah. And that's that does set the table for this. Or he's at least aware of it, like that that it's a thing. My big question about this episode is I didn't I couldn't quite connect. And maybe it's just because I maybe forgot season one or like I'm not totally up on my Richie characterization. I couldn't quite connect like. Did Richie need to learn how these restaurants work and the amount of care that goes into what they're doing? Like, Mm -hmm. I didn't get a sense that Richie was that green, you know, like he seems like a guy that has lived in this world. Did he just not get that people cared about their jobs? You know? Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Well, in in what ways do you think he was quote unquote in this world though? I don't think he's ever worked in a fine dining establishment or anything like that. Well, no, I guess not, but he's been at, you know, the beef for a long time. Like, and there was enough there that they felt comfortable throwing him into a fine dining scenario. And he doesn't, seem immediately overwhelmed by it like he's complaining about doing forks whereas like if if i would imagine if you took any line cook uh you know out of like a sandwich restaurant and said like hey i'm gonna put you in the top restaurant on the planet they would be (laughs) happy cleaning forks while observing (laughs) you know and maybe that's unique to richie but like he seems to push back a bit much for someone who hasn't spent time in that world you know like I, I had the opposite reaction. I'm like, I'm surprised he's not pushing back more uh, being, okay. put in this situ- being put in this situation, you know? Uh, but I think that there there was something that had to happen where Richie, throughout the season, we've been told he doesn't have that many discernible skills. Um, he himself doesn't believe he has that many discernible skills. Um, this episode was a way for him to discover what he was good at. And I did think that that conversation between him and Olivia Coleman's character at the end of the episode was really lovely. Um, and just, it's them getting to know each other, but them, um, she also says to him like, Carm believes in you. And I think that's really, really important to Richie and, and something he didn't understand throughout the season. And it took Academy Award winning actress, Olivia Coleman to explain that to him, you know, yeah, <laughs> for him to I mean, really uh, internalize it. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a, it's been a big Olivia Coleman week be- between this uh, and Secret, Secret Invasion. Invasion. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think one is a vastly superior <laughs> place for her to be, but you know, and yeah. that is Secret Invasion. No, um, <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> no that's jo- that's joking about that. So. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I just like I I never like charted that his attitude towards the work was out of like a lack of um, care about his work. Um, But either way, I do think this episode largely works. Um, And I mean, yeah, you roll out like, you know, these performances and I like how his journey is like echoed in many different ways with everybody kind of going off on their own little sojourns. You know, I think this one is probably, you know, uh, very similar, uh, you know, to, to Tina's where, you know, she encounters this group of people that almost take her in as like a second family over the span of yeah. her seems much longer than a week. Um, but yeah. And, and Marcus has a similar arc as well, I think, but um, the reason I bring up forks in particular is because it feels like Richie has the biggest change, right? Sure. Like like, um, Marcus was kind of, it's just developing him on the path that he's already on. He's an inquisitive character. Um, the Tina and Ibrahim stuff did feel like it got a little short change this season. I have to say like, yeah it, it, yeah, it felt like we were missing a whole episode of what's going on. We see a little like glimpses of Ibrahim kind of cutting class and stuff, but it felt like we were missing a ton of Ibrahim and what happened there between him and Tina. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I do like the ultimate end to yes. where Ibrahim, Ibrahim lands. Like I like, and, and maybe it's just like an, an ethics thing. Like I like that this restaurant was like, Hey, we still have a place for you. Yeah, here. yeah. You know, like so that's they're just basically a, a doing nice drive idea. through yeah. drive through beef sandwiches. That's kind of what they're still doing, right? So, um, of the uh, from the previous restaurant. So, like that's kind of where Ibrahim feels like he can work. But yeah, it did feel like that that arc got a little bit. We we were missing a little bit to to fully develop that. Um, and, and it's it's realistic, I think, to the world of food culture. I know you and I are, are uh, you know uh, are a bit of foodies. Maybe you more than me. But like a lot of these restaurants do have their kind of daytime, uh, you know, like 
cheaper, you know, uh, like takeout food. I think about like here in LA, you've got like Kismet does their rotisserie, you know, from like a side window, you know, um, yeah, and then yeah, yeah. more upscale stuff. If you sit down in the restaurant. Yeah. Um, um, so let's talk about Claire, a topic that we don't <laughs> want to discuss. Right? Yeah. Um, Molly Gordon, I think has great chemistry with Jeremy Allen White, but I found her introduction and her characterization to be pretty thin. She's basically the bare equivalent of a manic pixie dream girl, in my opinion. She obviously <laughs> served. Ser- so what's she the obvi- Chicago version of that? <laughs> yeah. She obviously served a useful thematic purpose. She created tension between Carmi's personal life and professional life. But at the end of the day, I found very little to root for her in their relationship, other than that she's like a nice person. Um, yeah. It, di- it didn't really work for me that well right down to the fact that they met randomly at the supermarket (laughs) (laughs) that was kind of like oh this is uh, i guess that does that kind of stuff does happen but like yeah um it felt very oddly purposeless in a show that feels very purpose like where everything in the show has meaning me giving you this outfit sydney at the you know there's so much meaning in every single action and then it's just like oh claire uh she just was at the same ice cream or the same uh, fridge uh, that, as I was, you know, when, when, when I we went to the grocery store, you know, what did you think of the character of Claire, Dan? Did this character work for you? I, uh, I, I joked at one point watching the show with my wife, I turned to her and said like, this character exists and this actress is hired to just bat her eyelashes. And then immediately it cut to a close up of her just <laughs> batting her eyelashes silently. And we both burst out into laughter um, yeah, I mean, it's like, they're, these are two attractive people, you know, <laughs> yep. put into yep. a space with each other That is and true. that will have inherent value <laughs> to some people. Um, but like, there is not really a deep connection here. Like we, like all we really know about Claire is that she is very thirsty for Carmi and, uh, she is a nurse and that's going okay for her, although she doesn't really seem to be all that stressed out by the, the nurse, nurse lifestyle in that she is hanging on every text message and call from, from Carmi to a point that is kind of like Carmi's reaction to that is, is, is almost obsessive. Sorry, she's a doctor. Uh, uh, she's not a nurse, um, which further emphasizes my point. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I just like, I felt well, doctors no... can have personal lives, Dan Kavos. Well, but, yeah. well, I understand that my parents are both doctors. I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very aware of that. But, um, anyway, like I just, I, there was nothing here. Um, and I also think like thematically, I don't really know, like you mentioned like that she's meant to be like the counter to like all the work that Carmi is supposed to be doing. But even then, I'm not sure how to feel about that either, because like early on in the season, Carmi is told like, hey, you like you need to have a life outside of the restaurant to bring to your work to enrich the work that you're doing. Um, And in the final episode, he gets locked in a refrigerator and everything goes fine without him doing anything anyway. Right. So like he could have very well just been sitting out in the restaurant having a drink with Claire and. So that idea, you know, which well, maybe, I do think he he learns the wrong lesson from yes, yes. from being in the fridge, right? Yeah, he, he does. And 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 it, if we follow up on that in season three, and that Carmi realizes, like, oh wait, like maybe throwing yourself entirely into something isn't the way to go, um, then that could be interesting. Except that he kind of already adopted that mentality this season, and it's like telling us, like. I don't know how you felt, David, but the whole season I was thinking to myself, like, am I supposed to not like that he's doing this? Because frankly, he seems to have a pretty healthy work life balance. Um, (laughs) Right. And like as someone who really values that personally um, and is doing a job that might be considered a little bit lesser than because I value work life balance. um, Anyway, uh, like I I found its whole message through this character confusing, maybe in an intentional way, but like I couldn't grab on. It's a little bit. It's a little bit muddled. Here's my take on it. Here's my take on it is I think the entire character of Claire 
is basically summarized with this whole situation with the refrigerator, with a, a walk-in refrigerator, where throughout the season, Carm is supposed to uh, call this refrigerator guy Tony, who Natalie keeps referring to as Tom incorrectly throughout the whole season. Right. And there's a scene where he's about to call the fridge guy, and then Claire calls him, and then he's like, should I take the call from Claire? And he can't decide. And then before he can even do anything else, somebody else calls for his attention, right? That scene, that's that's the thesis of the whole show, is right. Claire distracts him from um, doing his job. And then, but and also... The split he's, second decision making. Right. Yeah. Right. But also he's very, just kind of torn in a bunch of different directions anyway. Um, but I think we are meant to have an ambi- I think we as the audience are meant to have an ambivalent feeling slash relationship with Carmi's uh, engagement with his work. On the one hand, we see how beautiful the creations he makes are. We see how valuable the family he's able to build is. Um, we see how good he is at it. And there's pleasure to be taken in how good someone is at something like that. On the other hand, uh, it's also clearly something that's damaging to him, clearly something that's costing him uh, his mental health, costing him time with you know this other relationship, like to, to the point where he tries to actively repel her by giving her the wrong number, which is like a really, I don't know how she, as you said, she must really be into him because most people. She's really you know, into him, David. Like every second on screen is is spent with her slowly <laughs> inching towards him. Did you see this? Did you see this viral tweet online that happened recently where this woman posted this text thread uh, between her and a first date that she was supposed to have, right? And the guy texts her, hey, uh, about to leave, you know, so I'll see you soon, right? And she says, oh, let me know when you need my address. And he says, oh, um, to be honest, I didn't know I was supposed to pick you up. But hey, uh, tell me your address. I'm happy to come over, pick you up. He, she doesn't reply. And then he says, okay, I guess not. And then she says, yeah, that's okay. Don't worry. Like, have fun with your boys this weekend. And he's like, how am I going to do that? I have, a, I have a car full of picnic supplies. <laughs> and that's, that's the whole text. And basically, this woman was upset that this guy didn't read her mind that she wanted him to come pick him up or pick her up. And then when he offered to do so, change the plan, do so, she was like, whatever, like we don't need to see each other again. And she, then she, this woman posted this text thread and was like, this is me like valuing my own time and myself. And everyone was like, you, like a bunch of people were like, you go girl. And like, whatever. And then 10,000 people were like, you're going to die alone. Oh my (laughs) God. (laughs) You know, like sounds like the internet. Um, Yeah. yeah. But my point being, um, people have rejected men for much uh, much lighter <laughs> uh, things than giving her the wrong number. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, yes, clearly she was super into him. That's fine. I accept that. But, like, that, that's that's her defining characteristic in many ways. Right? Will, you, will you allow me to tell a funny, similar story? Please, please. Okay, so I, you know, we all uh, dated in our 20s. And, Did uh, yeah. I, I, well, I hope so. But uh, uh, I I uh, went on a uh, date with a young woman and uh, I was rejected for a second date uh, because she had a dream that featured me. And uh, and I was an asshole in the dream. Wow. And uh, it, I, I didn't know. I thought we had a great first date. And then it came out like weeks later. She was like, oh, I, I thought the dream was reality. And that was our second date. And I was so caught up in the dream like that, like. I just thought you were an asshole. So I'm texting you like months later to apologize. That wasn't actually you. Wow. Um, incredible. And, yeah. Incredible. So like people have been rejected by things they didn't even, weren't even involved in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. 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 So, so, so dating, anyway, dating yeah. is wild. Yeah. Going back to my interpretation of the Claire stuff, though, do you yeah. agree? Like, I, I think we're meant to, it's meant to be this push pull. We're meant to be torn about how we feel about yeah, Carmi, saying, Carmi's engagement with the restaurant. It's interesting in the first episode, he's even asked, like, do you love this? And he's kind of answers like, I'm good at it. And he's not even sure really that he loves 
doing it. And mm-hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, like, you know, it, it is interesting in the final like episode, everyone else seems to be having a great time right. and working really well together, except for the guy that's screaming in the refrigerator. Um, and the, the bear seems to function despite him. Um, mm-hmm. I, I was uh, interested, uh, it, like this whole subplot, you know, with, um, Sydney where she seems to be like losing confidence in him didn't come to a head at the end of the season. Like I legit thought she was going to walk away mm-hmm. and that would be the conclusion of the season. But I almost wonder if it's the opposite. Like they're going to push him out in season three, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I, I think it is worth mentioning that there has been a massive online contingent that is shipping Sydney and Carm. Uh, like they want them to be romantically together. I asked my um, wife about that early on in the season, but by by the end, it's, I was like, "No, please, please do not." There, there is a there is a backlash to the shipping, um, and then there is a backlash to the backlash as well. So that's what's a, that's what the the show has not been out for a week as we're recording this, <laughs> and literally everything I just said has already happened. Um, yeah, but uh, let me just say, I was against like. Some people are saying, oh, how dare you anti- be anti-ship in this case? Because uh, she's a black woman and there's like um, uh, a racial component to this. And if you're anti-shipping, uh, then th- that racial component needs to be read onto your anti-shipping tendencies. I'm just going to say, I'm David Chen just going to say, I was anti-shipping in general years <laughs> ago. Like <laughs> for, for for literally virtually every single show. And I think that, uh, l- l- I'm being facetious. If you want to ship Karma and Sydney, do be you do do whatever you want to do i do think it fundamentally misunderstands what this show is trying to accomplish with the relationship though and i think it's somewhat refreshing that we have a show where these two again very attractive people sydney and um uh and carm share a really deep personal connection uh and do not have a romance like that is in my opinion a refreshing development and it's very you know it, it, it's all it's very rich you know the, the scene in the finale when they're fixing the table together and he kind of gives her her outfit um it's a very uh or is, i think that might be the second to last episode anyway uh it's a very poignant moment between the two of them and I, I i don't know i've never gotten the sense that the show wants us to think of that in ro- th- that relationship in romantic terms. What do you think, Dan Boston? They're close, but it's much more of a sibling relationship than it is a romantic relationship. And I, I think like I got misconstrued early on. I knew that they wanted them to be close in some way, but the episode where if they wanted to do something romantic or even hint towards that in the future is where the one where she's introduced to Claire. Um, wh- when Claire comes into the shop, there isn't any kind of hinting of romantic jealousy. What it is, is annoyance that this right. person is taking time away from the restaurant. Absolutely. Like, if that Sydney is, is yeah. in love with anything, it's the restaurant, Yeah, you know? Um, and, you know, and sh- sh- there even is a romantic interest for Sydney later. And she rejects it. I think because she doesn't want to mix up work and romance in 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 any way um Mm -hmm. or she might just not be interested in general but i don't get the sense that there's any kind of like i think even later in the season she is complimentary towards claire um you know it's it's mostly just about like carm's you know uh you know relationship with her and as reflected by sydney and her father who in the final episode says like no this is the thing like to put all of your weight behind you know and i could see that continuing to develop if that's something that carm is not willing to do or the the effect that carm has or everybody's different carm may not need to put his full weight behind something you know in a way that might be deleterious to his own mental health um so anyway yeah, that's yeah. my take on it. I think you're yeah, right on. I yeah. don't think romance is in the cards, and I really hope it's not. Yeah, I, I, I just appreciate their relationship so much, and and yeah, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with shipping. Like, if it makes you happy, ship away. Like, that's fine. I just there's been a lot of shipping recently in general of people, but 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 where it feels like. I feel like I'm watching a different show than people, you know, where it's like I, I feel like we're we're fundamentally misaligned 
me and the shippers are fundamentally misaligned on like what the pleasures of the show are, we, what the show is trying to say and do with its characters. I, and I this, think it's yeah. just a misconstruing of like cinematic language, which is like yeah, yeah. they're they're saying like we're going to put these characters close to each other and allow them to to be um, intimate, right? They are like they are sharing like soft moments together, and I think you know people automatically jump to the cinematic language of these two should be together. Right. But I think if there's anything this season and the show shows us in general, it's like there's a lot of tender moments between all the characters, um, uh, including the male characters with each other, you know, and like them supporting each other in various different ways. Uh, so anyway, but hey, hey Dank of Austin, who knows? Maybe you and I are going to be completely wrong about this. And uh, later on, we'll find out that uh, Sydney and Carm uh, wedding bells will be ringing in season four. Or something <laughs> like that for the show. Yeah, right. So. Yeah, there's a couple of the things I want to talk about in terms of the finale. Uh, first of all, I think Claire just being at the fridge uh, is a little bit soap opera yeah. theatrical. Like, you know what what happened there? Um, Tina was listening, and then the, was Claire just show? Uh, she's like, Tina, it's okay, you can go away. I'm listening to to Carm now. You know, like, let well, me through, girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ki- kind of silly, but um, I-, I was ultimately okay with it because it was just representing that Claire eventually is going to find out about this internal conflict that Carm has. And yeah, if she's going to find out about it through a fridge door or whatever, who cares, you know, like, uh, but it, it did strike me as a little bit weird. And then, um, there's a really powerful shouting match that Carm has with Richie at the end. Uh, and I guess I'm kind of wanted to see what you thought about that because they kind of, they kind of say some really ugly things to each other at that moment. And this is one of the reasons why I think season two doesn't feel like the ending. I, I, we can't leave those characters like that can't be how we leave those characters in my opinion. Like I, I, I that would make me feel bad personally, but, um, but Hey, if the show gets canceled, maybe that's where that's, that is where we leave them. And I'll have to accept that. What did you think of that ending for the characters given that Richie kind of had put himself together and Carm and Richie seemingly had a good relationship. And then kind of in this moment of anger, it all came coming out came flooding out Dan Kavosin. Well, I, I do think we're going to get another season. Like, I, I think this has kind of become like a bit of the, a darling of both, of, you know, Hulu FX service. But, um, I, I think it's, it's, it was totally a, a, like appropriate to showcase because like we, we end episode seven with Richie, not really like, he's like, Oh yeah, I have another thing referring to the bear, you know, but like, he did feel yeah, very he's not accepted. All in. He, he, he's yeah. not all in on it, right? Yeah. Because um, he, want, he, he wanted to get a job at the at the new place, right? Yeah, so. and I, I think <laughs> he sees like kind of like personalities that there that like allow him to become this new person that when he's back mm-hmm. at the bear, he goes back into family mode. You yeah. know, like yeah. there is that toxicity of the family, you know, because the bear isn't completely divorced from his family. Like, yeah. like that, that stuff still finds its way in there. And Carmi being kind of the biggest representation of that, you know, him being locked in the fridge, there is the thing I think that lets them be successful, you know? Uh, and I think that that is yet to be explored. As I, I mentioned earlier, is like, I think Carmi is still the one holding on to that toxic environment um, that everybody else is able to kind of move past. Um, and if it ends up with him losing everybody around him uh, and the restaurant falling to pieces because of his presence, then so be it. Like, I think I, 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 da- I dare say that this show has a sort of, um, um, oh my gosh, why am I forgetting the name of the soccer show? Um uh, believe uh why am i forgetting ted lasso. it ted had lasso. yeah I, I i dare say it has a bit of a ted lasso feel about like our relationship to work which is like ted lasso is all about like we can build a non-toxic uh you know football environment you know and like what does that look like um and all these people in this season go off to other places and bring back a sort of like better attitude about work life um, that, and even Carmi, like, it, it, like goes away and has this relationship that seems to be mellowing the guy out a little bit. Um, you know, I wonder if season three or, or the future of the show is about like, how do you create a non-toxic, you know, uh, environment in the American workspace? Yeah. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about that because that was kind of one of my big problems with the show. And maybe later seasons will undo this problem or maybe, you know, I, I, I think a lot of people will probably disagree with my next point. But hey, it wouldn't be decoding TV if people weren't <laughs> disagreeing with Dave Chen, right? So my big issue, so we've just spent like, other than the Claire conversation, we've just spent like an hour talking about why we love this show. There's many great things about The Bear Season 2. One of my big problems with The Bear Season 2 is how it seemingly valorizes high-end dining over, uh, you know, like a neighbor that of a neighborhood restaurant. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Um, now, I think the, the problem I have with it like I basically disagreed with the premise of the bear season two, which is <laughs> they're they're trying to make the original beef of Chicago land into the bear, this high end restaurant. And I think in general, we, as the audience, I think in general, my speculation is in general, we, as the audience are meant to root for them to succeed. That's my feeling on what the show wants us to do. Yeah. When it is presented as a bad idea, like when the 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 notion that this might be a bad idea is presented, it is not presented as there's something inherently wrong with high end restaurants. It's presented as it's hard for high end restaurants to succeed. That is what is presented, right? Um, so when Sydney has a conversation with her father, uh, he says, eh, "I don't know. It can be pretty tough to start a restaurant. You know, like it, it can be pretty tough." Like, and then Sydney visits all these the restaurants, and they're all shutting down, and it's hard to maintain a restaurant. And and so that is the biggest obstacle to making a high-end restaurant is like, it's an economically challenging thing to do. But I, I Dan Kavaz, and I, David, you know, I am a person who loves uh, fine dining. I love eating in high-end restaurants. I appreciate the theatricality of a lot of it. I appreciate the care that's been put into it. I appreciate just the whole experience. It's like magic. You know, you walk in and people play something in front of you that you've never tasted before. It has been created using ingredients you would never have access to. And it's just like, wow, I, I enjoy it greatly. Over the course of the last few years, it has become clear to me how much abuse occurs because of the culture of these restaurants. Um, how much abuse occurs because there's this one guy, you call him chef. He's the guy in charge. And, uh, he often, uh, and it's often a, he, uh, does things that he shouldn't or feels like he's empowered to do things that he shouldn't. And in Seattle, where we have a lot of great chefs and great restaurants, uh, this has happened very demonstrably. Uh, I'm going to just name a few actual examples. Um, we had a really amazing restaurant called June baby. Who's, uh, the main chef was, was me too. We had a uh, amazing restaurant that I got engaged at called the Willows Inn mm -hmm. uh, that uh, where allegations of abuse and wage theft, uh, racism and so on were exposed by the New York Times. And that restaurant today no longer exists. It has been shut down. Um, and it was like wh when I went to it, it was one of the most amazing dining experiences I've ever had. And so um, I was hoping given especially given like the glimpse of Carm's life at the restaurant we got in season one i was hoping that season two of the bear would reckon with any of this that i've discussed we see that working at a high at a high-end restaurant or any restaurant costs these characters like their personal lives but there's nothing about like hey something is inherently sick in in many ways about making a high-end restaurant or at the very least there's nothing inherently better about the bear than the original beef of Ch Chicago land beef, you know, restaurant like, yeah. Um, and that was a big disappointment to me because it's like, we, we are meant to, when, when Richie goes to the forks episode and the forks episode to the nice restaurant, it's like, we're meant to be like, Oh yeah, this is what real service feels like. It's like, but it's like, there's my parents owned a Chinese takeout restaurant for 16 years. You know, there's nothing wrong with that style of food and making that food. And, and, and people can get lots of meaning from that food as well. And it feels like the show just completely bl like glosses over any of that. And is like, Hey, this bear, the bear thing, this is what the real story, this is what really the final, you know, manifestation of what this restaurant should be is this high end, but forget about the Chicago land, but you know, we'll have a, uh, uh, the original beef of Chicago land, by the way, is the name of the restaurant. We'll have a takeout window for that stuff. But like, this is where it's really at. This is the thing. 
What do you think, Dagvazin? Am I completely nonsense raving, ranting, or is there some validity to anything I'm saying? I think there's a lot of validity to what you're saying. Um, I, I don't, I'll push back a little bit in that I don't think it holds up fine dining as an entirely serious endeavor, like that's worthy of our acclaim. Um, I do think there is some pushback to that. Like uh, there's this whole element in, in the restaurant that Richie goes to work at of who caused the smear, you know? And like my read on that was, it was satirizing the level of seriousness with which these people take their work, um, which is, you know, somebody caused the smear and someone needs to step up. And clearly like everyone in the high end level of that institution is losing their minds about the smear. They're like, we understand it's just a smear, but it's more than that. It's, you know, and yeah, yeah, that's uh, true. That's true. I do. I do think it's meant to be, and, and it, it's meant to undercut, like they have this whole like beautiful, yes, we ostensibly stalk these people and find out their favorite things. (laughs) And, you know, like, and, I think you're supposed to go, Oh, that is kind of valorous and, and creepy. Like Richie seems to react to that in a way that's like, I don't know how I feel about that. Um, but then you see this family come in and my wife even remarked like how beautiful that like they can provide this family with that. Yeah. But at the same time on the back end, uh, like it is making fun of the smear and the, like, how seriously these people take themselves. I don't think it's super even handed. It's much more leaning into like, look at how beautiful of an experience they can provide these vaunted people in our society. Um, and people that apparently have saved every inch of their life. How, how gracious of them to not take away all of their life savings for coming to this restaurant (laughs) for, for one night. Right. But, But it does immediately undercut that by being like how silly everyone is around that table about the, the trends, the crime of the century, the smear. Um, yeah. And there, you, you sense a glimpse of the abuse too, because I think at one point, one of the characters is like, fuck you, you know, like yeah. in that scene, one of the characters is like, fuck you. And it's, and he just has to eat it. Yeah. Yeah. And, just, and there's yeah. a lot, there is a lot of like anger and tension in, you know, uh, high end kitchens. And, and I, I think that was a nod to that, but I also think you're right. It's not even handed. It's like 80 to 90%. This is like a positive thing. Yeah. And like, yeah, there's some downsides to it, but like overall it's a good thing. And, and Richie transforms his life because of it and becomes, I think the audience, I think the audience is meant to root for Richie becoming a kind of more put together person, more disciplined person. Right. That's ultimately the journey of that character that we're supposed to get behind. And I think like it's enabled because of his, a stint as a stage at this restaurant. So, but, but you do point out, he does get to remain himself, you know, like, and I do think in the final episode of the show, like there is some valor to him, like still yelling, like, fuck you to everybody in like a joking, playful that, way. But like th- that just reinforces my point though. Is like, yeah, it is meant to be seen as an overwhelmingly positive force in his life. That's my, like, yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 that costs him very little in that he still gets to retain his, his personality. So like, um, so anyway, uh, I, I, I guess I guess my my point is I don't I think it's lack of clarity is not just in regards to high end, you know, uh, dining. Like, I think everybody is pulling a little bit from a value from everywhere. Um, but you're right. It is heavily leaning, you know, like all these people are sent off to artisans of, of the craft um, and right. no and nobody is sent to work in like. Uh, like a kitchen and find out like how a low wage worker finds value in their life. Um, you know, in, 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 in that regard. So, yeah. um, uh, I, yeah, I, I appreciate you. I haven't seen this complaint brought up. So whenever I have a complaint and I don't see it brought up, I'm like, maybe I'm completely misreading the show. No, you know, that's, you're, you're, that's very you're not, but you're like, not. but I, I think that, um, it's, just, it's just a weird decision to me that the show is basically saying, uh, in, in, in many ways, not explicitly, but in many other ways saying fine dining is better. Like it's what Carm is dedicating his life to. Yeah. Yes. There are some huge downsides, like it's costing Carm his personal life and so on. But, it, but that is not a conflict between fine dining and, 
non-fine dining. It's but a conflict is, is between... Is it co- costing Carm his li- social life? Like, we see that the restaurant works just fine without him yeah, sacrificing. Yeah, I know. In, yeah, his, yeah. in his own mind, it's costing... You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, but like, yeah. But, like, I get, my, my, my point is, I am acknowledging that, that the show does provide some downsides of, like... Yeah. Of launching a restaurant, but it's it's never like this is the downside of a fine dining restaurant versus the original uh, beef of Chicago bread. You know what I'm saying? Which yeah. which also was already stressful in season one, yeah. right? Like so, it's it's stressful in different ways in season two. Um, very do or die, high stakes in season two, but. You know what I'm it saying? seems weirdly less stressful to be, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like right. the sort of like maybe it's just that the like the the walls are all white now, and I f- it makes it feel calming. <laughs> but like there yeah. is a le- like a like a like a level that's b- brought down, and I I think it gets to a kind of all other point is I think there's a sort of like um like privileged. Uh, uh, attitude about work in the show, which is mm-hmm. like, hey, if you throw everything into your work, like you can get real meaning out of that. And I just don't think that that's something that's even remotely accessible by the average American worker. You know, like what do you, I, what do you, what do you mean? Where do you where do you get that though? Like, I, I guess just because of the the positive moments that these characters share together, and yeah, like, yeah, yeah, and like the you know the like the show the show. I mean, I think it's not a stretch to say the show like valorizes like finding meaning in your work. You know, uh, and like that, if you put more into your work, you can get more out of it. Mm, and yeah. I don't think that like that. I mean, I, I speak about my own job. Like if I put more work into my work, I would definitely not get more out of it. It would, <laughs> it, it is happy. It's usually the opposite relationship. You it, it, it is. Well, it's my, my problem. I mean, if I'm yeah. speaking really honest, like I, it's my problem with my job is it has a really bad feedback loop, which is uh-huh, yeah. I could put more work into it and I will not get more out of it. And so it only, like reinforces that I should put less work I- into it. Right. You know, I, I agree um, that that's a very specific vision of work. I don't know that I would describe it as privileged though. I don't think these people in the show are privileged. No, uh, but I, but they, I think, they, I think it is. They pri- work for, they, they are, they are in a field that rewards further investment. The more work they put in. Right. What, what, yeah. what I'm saying is like, that's a field that's not accessible by everyone. You know, like a lot of people have jobs where like, uh, they've been told like the American dream of like break, break your back and you'll get more out of it. And that's not always true for most people. And I think, um, you know, like these are people that you're seeing like a- attain, which I mean, whatever it's capitalism right? and it's the basis yeah. of story structure is like, yeah. if you put more into it, you get more out, like characters are growing and so on and so forth. But I did want to acknowledge like, it is an attitude about work that not many people have access to uh, in in their lives. That's fair, Dan. I, I agree that that a lot of people probably don't work in fields that allow this. But I think in terms, you know, a lot of these people, um, in terms of professions, they could have chosen to yeah. illustrate that in. Uh, you know, starting off as a, a a line cook at the original Beef of Chicago Land, and then working your way up to uh you know working at the bear yeah. is 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 not like um it doesn't strike me uh, you know as i said already privilege is not the word i'd use for it you know yeah, I, yeah I maybe think... maybe that's not the word i'm using uh, cuz I, I will say on the other hand like uh i do think it's very rare to get like uh, this kind of look at entrepreneurship in mm-hmm. television um that's that's not like documentary um yeah. and, and so like i think that's really wonderful like this is like a like a you know, maybe a particular slice of Amer- American uh, worksman- worksmanship, but you know, and and that's why I bring like an extra spotlight to it. Is like it is rare that we get something this like unvarnished about like how much money it takes to start your own business or how much work goes into that, how much you have to sacrifice. Um, you know, there's a million different stories we could get about that, and I watch them all the time. Like I watched a New York Times documentary the other day about uh, uh, the guy who hand makes all the bagels for a bunch of different, you know, bagel mm-hmm. shops in New York. And it made me cry, you know, mm-hmm. like t- to see someone throw so much of their life into their work for something that like we may not take for granted. And, uh, or and we may anyway, take for granted. Or we may yeah. take for granted. Yeah. yeah. And like just seeing that portrayed in such a beautiful way, you know, I do get a similar pleasure out of the bear. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, but yeah, to, to, to wrap up that point, I think I was just, uh, I thought it was just an, a, a weird decision to to be like, hey, <laughs> to kind of to kind of like 
retcon elements of season not not even retcon but basically we knew that they wanted to reopen as the bear but basically like hey we're gonna make this beloved neighborhood sandwich joint into a higher uh, the the entire previous clientele is basically not going to be particularly interested in this anymore um and that's what we are have set as this goal which in many ways people will regard as a beneficial goal because it improves everyone's lives that that was just a weird premise for the season to take in my opinion i i, um, I do appreciate the clarity though because i felt like last season they were doing some like high-end fine dining stuff in the yeah, confines of this sandwich joint yeah, and it's like yeah. is is the clientele gonna want your like <laughs> handcrafted <laughs> right. who's paying for the handcrafted desserts at the beef of chicago land you know yeah, it's uh, it's it's weird and and um and i do think it would have been a, a, a potentially more interesting path to take of like hey carm whipping original beef of chicago land into into shape like that I guess he did that in season one already, and that's yeah. why they needed to go a different way. But I, I just think there's a lot of value in restaurants like the original Beef of Chicago. Land, I, you know? I agree. I agree. That, that are that, that basically goes almost completely unacknowledged in season two, other than you know the the, the, the drive through window. Like it's and that that's sad to me because again, my parents used to own a restaurant like that, and yeah. I saw the value it brought to people's lives, and I saw people come into the restaurant over the course of years that like you know grew up with the restaurant they were you know it, it, it informed so many aspects of their lives and it's like those r- times the restaurants can be that way too and it was sad that the bear didn't acknowledge any of that yeah and i think um, i'll miss the 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 like clientele that would come in to yeah, uh yeah, the yeah. Ba- the you know the beef of of yeah. chicago land anyway there is one random note i, I should have brought this up earlier when we talked about the finale dank Boston, but mm-hmm. there's one other random note i wanted to say which is in the season finale of the bear season two, there is this moment when they're wondering if, um, if their mom, uh, Carm's mom, Donna is going to show up. And there's an incredible scene in that episode where the character of, Pete, played by Chris Witosk, uh goes out to like sees Donna standing outside and goes out to like greet her. And that whole interaction is just incredible because he is clearly completely oblivious as to what is even going on. Like it's a little weird to me how oblivious he is. He doesn't seem to understand like any of the dynamics going on in the family of like <laughs> of you know, that the mom would be v- deeply torn about wanting to go in or not. And, and he's like, yeah, why don't you come in? What's wrong? You know, he doesn't, even, he was at the dinner where she drove through the house. So I, I, I he but was he, a little he bit. He is yeah. still like, uh, it is still being translated through his wife, who is a d- more direct member of yeah. the family. And yeah. she's much more positive about the inclusion of the mother than everybody else is. Mm, fair enough. So yeah, he uh, then has this interaction where he tries to convince her to come in and she declines uh, and then he accidentally lets loose that Natalie is pregnant. And then that like is very hurtful to the mom. I think that she was not told about that. And then he has like inadvertently triggered. And then Donna played by Jamie Lee Curtis puts him in an impossible position where he says like, okay, don't tell anyone else here. Like, goodbye. You have to promise. You're not going to yeah. tell anyone. Else. Promise. And he's, he just is so it's like putting this character in such a terrible position and he agrees, and I think I think he actually honors that request, if I recall correctly, right? Like, he yeah, I don't her. believe he tells yeah. anyone. So then he goes inside, but he's he's in tears, he's breaking down because like he's just experienced this most heartbreaking moment. Um, and th- that is one thing I appreciate about the bear is like there's no conventionally happy endings, right? Like the it, it, life is complicated and messy, and it's not like the mom comes in and they all make up and everyone's happy. It's like oftentimes in real life it doesn't end like that, and I think the way that things ended with Donna this season was this acknowledgement that yes, even though they've achieved great things, they built this restaurant from nothing. Um, it's not all just lollipops and sunshine for everyone. Um, I, th- that was one of the most powerful scenes of the season for me. What did you think of that scene? Dan Glossin? I thought it was, I, I agree with everything you said about the scene, you know, like in the back of my mind, I was worried that she would like come in to the restaurant and see that they had a dish called seven fishes and, 
she would, you know, have like a critic at the end of a uh, Ratatouille moment, <laughs> oh, you know, yeah, and like, yeah. but then someone brings out a fork and it triggers her again, you know, or, or something yeah. like that. Like you could see a worse show doing that. Yeah. You know, yeah. but um, like she just doesn't show up. She doesn't go in the restaurant, which is like amazing. Even worse, decision. she does show up, you know, yeah, just, yeah. but like, but doesn't come in, you know? Yeah. And, um, there's a, there's a line where she says like, I just don't have like a, I forget the exact phrasing. She said, but she says something along the lines of like, I don't have a connection to this world or I, I don't know how to experience this mm-hmm. world. Um, which maybe gets to your point about fine dining. Um, but you know, it, it's also, I think like, cause clearly food is important to her, you know, and her relationship to food. So I I'm eager to see if that continues to be explored that like, you know, how these kids end up in, you know, cooking is related to her in some way. And yet like ma- ma- through the food, is that some kind of way of exploring their distance? I, I-, I don't know um, what it is. I don't, I-, I don't think this is the end of the Jamie Lee Curtis character. Um, I- at least I hope not because it's a very like rich fertile yeah. ground to, to mine. Um Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Anyway, I don't have anything else to say. It's it, it was a great beat and went counter and, to what I expected. And to take this kind of jokey side character who who has largely been a source of comedic relief throughout the show. Yeah. Uh, and, and and like have one of the critical emotional moments of the entire season hang on that character. Just like such a bold move. Yeah, I bet uh, that actor when he got that yeah. script that day was very yeah, pleased. Like, I am, I am, I am <laughs> acting in one of the most critical scenes of the show with yeah, Academy yeah. Award winner Jamie Lee Curtis. It's amazing. I'm, I'm a character now, Mom. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. He, did, he did a great job in the scene too. Like I, I like that was a character who I basically didn't take very seriously, and then all yeah. of a sudden, I like my heart went out to him. And oh, it was just a, it was an amazing moment. So that's all. That's all it takes, you know. Is like one good scene, you know. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, really, really uh, great stuff. All right. Well, it's not a week by week recap, but those are some of the highlights of this season of the Bear. So much to discuss. Uh, so many amazing moments. So many things that uh, just prompted a lot of conversation and, and thinking. And I hope we've been able to provide you uh, some of that thinking through the course of this week in streaming here on Decoding TV. Uh, I want to mention, if you enjoy this podcast, we'd really appreciate it if you consider becoming a paid subscriber at DecodingTV.com. Um, I pay everyone who I work with, including Dan Gavosden, and the only way I'm able to do that is because of folks who are paid subscribers at DecodingTV.com. Be sure to follow us also on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, at Decoding TV, and email us. Let us know what you thought of the bear at DecodingTV at gmail.com or about anything we discussed today. Uh, we'd love to hear it. Dan Gavosin, you want to let people know where they can find more of your work on the internet? Sure, yeah. Um, I host a podcast called The Amazing Spider Talk. Um, it's a podcast all about Spider-Man. Uh, maybe you went and saw Across the Spider-Verse and you're feeling particularly keen on learning more about the character. Well, no better place to do it than my podcast. I'm a little biased, I will admit, but uh, I do think it's a great show. We cover the past present and future of the character. If you want to just learn about our feelings about the movies or the history of the character, come check out. We have seasonal episodes that break down uh, the whole history of the character um, one topic at a time. We talk about the records, the popsicles, the comics, you name it. Like Spider-Man is a transmedia character. And uh, we've had, we have over a hundred interviews with different creators who worked on the property from people who voice him in the video game to the uh, people who've portrayed him in the movies, uh, you name it. So that's amazing spider talk. Awesome. Dan Gavazin, let's talk about our favorite quotes from the season. We like to wrap up with favorite quotes. Any favorite quote from the season for you that stuck out? I mean, I've got like two. Uh, So the first one's a really small one, and it's in the first episode. There's a scene in the first episode where there's an alarm going off in uh, the restaurant. And Carmi asks another character, uh, is that in my head? Uh, (laughs) Yeah, that's an amazing moment, yeah. A great moment, but it's kind of my feeling about the entire show, which is mm-hmm. just like all of this kind of like destruction of the restaurant and all this stuff. It's all a like almost like mind palace for 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 Carmi, you know, like like to the point that the characters don't even know, like, like it, is their anxiety manifest or is that just their anxiety? You know, right, uh, right. and uh, I think like when when the show is operating at its best, it's kind of uh, like 
confusing you about like what's diegetic and what's non-diegetic. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, like uh, it is a feeling uh, of the bear. Um, and I thought that quote really uh, uh, summarized that really well. Now, the, my second favorite quote is not really a quote more than it is like a monologue um, from Oliver Platt gives this speech about Steve Bartman uh, that is quite lengthy. Uh, Steve Bartman being a uh, audience member uh, at a Cubs game who pulled in uh, a, a, a ball from the opposing team uh, or, or, or caught a foul ball rather. Um, didn't even catch it. He he went to catch a foul ball and accidentally prevented correct someone from the Cubs, Moises on the on the Cubs from catching it, and uh, then things folded for the Cubs soon after that. So it was it was one of the most notorious plays in baseball history. I remember I was watching t- TV when it happened, and uh, yeah, uh, he gives this speech about Bartman people being angry at Bartman, even though in fact other decisions that had been made until that point had created the problem. Yeah. And I connect with this particularly because I'm an Orioles fan, um, which is a, a rare, which is a rare bird, both in Maryland and uh, <laughs> among sports fans. Um, but uh, uh, there, we have our own version of this Jeffrey Mayer, who is a kid that um, caught a, uh, a ball and pulled it in for a home run against the Yankees in the world series. And poor Jeffrey Mayer got like, destroyed in, in, you know in Baltimore and I remember a friend of mine had an image of him on a, on his wall that he would throw darts at you know this poor kid you know and the whole idea is that like you don't want to be the Steve Bartman like you you don't want all this attention pointed at you when really all the errors that led on the way there were really the things that should have been blamed um rather than just a kid doing what a kid would do uh, and I thought that speech was amazing um and maybe like not the healthiest approach towards work culture, but um, you know, Platt just yeah. And, and when he says at the end uh, that he finds out that Carm has a girlfriend, he's like, "Uh oh!" It's like, "Wow, that's that's not a very good approach to work life balance, right?" Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was a, an incredibly delivered uh, speech of a a winding story that like I love a good winding story where they acknowledge halfway through, like, no, I'm going to get to my point. Like this is going somewhere, (laughs) you know, like, and, and that's really great about the show too, is it has a great flair for how people talk and tell stories. It's not always like a straight line from A to Z, you know? Um, So anyway, a a brilliant uh, monologue uh, uh, by Oliver Platt there. Um, Well, that. Uh, in, in addition to that, you know, in addition to like what you just said, I think I love a great speech that kind of makes you think differently about world events, you know? <laughs> and I think a lot of people, a lot of people blame Bartman for it, you know? Uh, but he kind of recontextualized the whole thing. It made you be like, oh, maybe that's, you know. Yeah, yeah my, my, so. my childhood apologies to Jeffrey Mayer uh, uh, as well, so. Uh, I love the little moment that Sydney and her dad share at the end of the show where or at the end of the season where you know early on the season he was wondering you know what why um why is this restaurant so important to you you know um if this fails can't you just move on to the next thing and then uh he's then able to experience the brilliance and joy and wonder of the restaurant and then affirms to her this restaurant it's the thing it's the thing that's what he says at the end um what do you think was that did it for him? Was it the cart of soda? Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think, I think uh, the the finale did a good enough job of like illustrating some good food porn, some good service. You can yeah. get a sense of why people would fall in love with this place. You don't you know? get a lot of people enjoying the food out in the restaurant itself because we're so consumed by the creation yeah. process. But the little looks at it that we get are meaningful. I think, indeed. All right. This episode has gone on far longer than I thought it would, but it's been a great conversation. And I do think for 10 episodes of a show, you know, I wanted to deliver something on Decoding TV that's worthy of yeah. that amount of time. Um, we hope you have enjoyed this conversation. Uh, we got Secret Invasion coming. We got Silo coverage coming and other stuff down the pipeline. So uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast at podcast.decodingtv.com if you want to stay tuned with what's going on in television this summer. And also uh, become a paid member at decodingtv.com if you want to support the show and make it possible. 
Until next time, thanks so much for listening. See you later. And thanks, Dan Gavasson, for joining me today. Hey everyone, David Chen here. Thank you so much for watching that video from Decoding TV. If you want to get an audio version of the show, all you got to do is go to podcast.decodingtv.com. And if you want to support what we do, get ad-free episodes of the podcast and also bonus episodes of the podcast, go to decodingtv.com and become a paid member. Of course, you can also like and subscribe for more. We appreciate it. Thanks. See you later.